I want to thank you all for inviting me back. Last time I came, there was a bit of bad weather, and, and we went and saw the damage in Matador the next day, so it was quite a storm. My wife and I went down with the elder and his wife, and we got an eyeful of what a first hand one tornado can do, so um, we were able to help that church. I know many others did as well, so I appreciate the opportunity to come back and speak. And when I heard it was going to rain tonight, I'm like, here we go again. <laughs> So I hope nothing will come of that. So if you will, turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. We'll be there in just a minute. Mark chapter 10. I do want to say uh, I'm going to have to warn the church in Memphis about Neil coming next week because he's saying words like dulcet, which I have no idea what that means. They're used to me, and I'm pretty a low vocabulary. And so I don't have any idea what that word means. You got to inform me afterwards what that means. Man. I have no idea. I forgot. <laughs> I just heard it. I just used it because he's down the big sound for me. So, you will speak any time. He can't interpret it. Let's go ahead and just pray. Holy Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time to search your word, to look at it closely. And I pray, Lord, that you will enlighten us, you'll encourage us, you'll lift us up. I pray that as we hear your word, we will look at it uh, in depth tonight, and we will understand what it says. We will take it to heart, and we'll put it into effect. Because we know, Lord, that when we put your word into effect, great things happen. Because we truly try to live like you lived on this earth. So I pray, Lord, that we will be enlightened tonight to be able to do just that. We do pray, Lord, for uh, the weather. We pray that there will be no issues tonight. And we do thank you for the rain that you brought us recently. We all we, we know that we all desperately need it this time of year. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. About six years ago, now we started the Spanish work over in Memphis. And one of the things we did to kick that off is we invited uh, Sunset School of Preaching in Lubbock to bring some Spanish speakers to help us. Uh, Memphis is probably about 50 to 60 percent Hispanic. A lot of them don't speak English or very much English. And so we had the students come up to help us because many of the people we talked to, we really couldn't have much of a conversation with. When we did that, one of the students that, that came to help us was a young lady who was from a little country called Togo, Africa. And she is French. And it's a French protectorate. And she was wanting to learn Spanish because uh, she thought she might do something like that in the mission field, but uh, anyway, she went back to Togo, but she came up to Memphis many times, and we got to know her pretty well. Uh, anyhow, even though she was born in Togo, which is in East Africa, she was educated in France, and she was very well educated, and that's where she was converted. And while she was converted into France, missionaries from France converted her brother and his wife in Togo. And so she came to America to come to Sunset, to go to school, and her brother went to Ghana to go to school at a World Bible School uh, school, so he could become a preacher and evangelist. Now, so long as the main uh, evangelist in the area of Togo where they worked, but they both went back there, and she worked with him. Uh, he does all the preaching and the teaching, but he, she works with the women and with the children, doing various things, and they're a pretty good team. Uh, they could be living in France. It's a lot easier to live in France. You can have a, a much better paying jobs, a much easier lifestyle, much easier health care, or good health care, and all the comforts of a first world country. But instead they live in Togo, which is a third world country. They chose to stay in a country that is very uh, poor conditions. A country that is very poor health care, has lots of malaria, things like that, very difficult situation to work. But the work they're in has been very successful. They baptize a lot of people every year. They have started five congregations and they're working on number six right now. Uh, AEO works, like I said, with the children and the women. There's a lot of work in that area that needs to be done. Every year she has a women's conference and somebody from America comes over and works with her and they teach about five or six hundred women at that conference. 
She also makes sure the kids get vaccinated, uh, that they get school supplies, obviously that they know about God, and helps do women's classes in all those five congregations. She does lots of counseling and help with her brother in this work. And not very long ago, they were in a, a, an accident, a car accident. And Salah broke his leg, his femur. And so he was out of commission for a bit, and he had a huge cast. But as soon as they cleared him to preach, he wanted to go preach. Well, that part of Africa is not very easy to get around. And so there's a video of them in a canoe. Now, we're thinking, I've not been to a canoe, maybe a Boy Scouts. They're canoeing down a very large river. Salam has got his cast up on the his thing, and there's a group of people together. And when they get there, I was watching the video, and somebody is carrying Salam up the slope to go to the church where he's going to preach. Guess who was carrying him? His sister, Enya. And so Enya, that really amazed me, her undying spirit. Uh, Enya has had malaria three times in the last four years. Been very sick. Can I get Miss Medicine there? We have actually sent medicine from the U.S. to her with some people from Lubbock to make sure she got what she needed. And then we had to pay to get through customs, which was more expensive than the medicine, so that she could get what she needed. But I want you to know that even though it's a very difficult situation for them, and, and even though she's been sick, and the doctors told her she needed to go back to France, she will not. She said, I'm going to stay and work with my people so they can hear the gospel. I'm going to work with my brother until the Lord takes me from this earth, which in her case may be an early grave because of all the sickness that she has had. Not only that, a few years ago, her, one of her sisters had so many children, and she was very close to one nephew, Enya was, named Ephraim, that they gave their child to her to raise. She's single, never been married. She's about 40 years old. And so she took on this child and she's raising him by herself in a very difficult situation. Instead of taking the easy path, they've chosen a hard path. A path of service, a path of suffering, and a path of sacrifice. I admire them greatly. And they both will have a big impact on the kingdom, not just now, but in the future, because they chose to serve instead of be served. Love does not ask what it can get, but it asks what it can give. And that's what real love looks like. So tonight, I want to talk about what real love looks like. And we want to talk about Jesus and some of the things that he did. So we're going to talk in the book of Mark about what it means to suffer and to serve and to sacrifice. So I want to give you a bit of context and so to do that, we want to read Mark 10, 32 to 34. It says, Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was, among, uh, was going before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. Then he took the twelve aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests, and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him, and scorch him, and spit on him, and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. I want to give you a bit of context here in this situation. Jesus is going with his disciples up to Jerusalem. He's going to die. He knows what he's going for. He knows what the purpose is. And it says that the disciples are amazed, and they're afraid. And that's kind of an interesting thing. How can you be amazed and afraid at the same time? But I don't have any doubt that it's because Jesus is intense in this moment. He is intense, and he is intent about what is going to happen. And so it says they were walking behind him. They're following him. They're not walking with him. They're following him at this point. I think his intensity, his purpose is on him, and they can feel that weight. And so they're hanging back as they walk toward Jerusalem. And then he calls the twelve aside, and he starts to talk to them. And his intensity comes out. He tells them, Behold, I am going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him to the Gentiles. And he talks about what will happen. He says they will mock him, and scourge him, and spit on him, and kill him. 
He does give them a bit of good news at the end that on the third day he will rise from the dead. I'm sure, though, they're thinking about all those other things he said. They're going to do what? That's probably not the first time he said this to them. But when Peter says that to him in Matthew, he tells the disciples, Peter's going, I don't think so. He starts to rebuke Jesus. No, that's not what's going to happen. He says, get behind me, Satan. You have in mind the things of men, not the things of God. And so he is very intense right now. He's telling them what is happening. He tells them what's going to go on. And right after this, something is going to happen that we're going to talk about in depth tonight. But Jesus is in a very serious nature right now. He's very intense, and he's got a lot of feelings starting to show. And so he's very serious, and now this topic is going to come up, which I think is a very interesting time for this to happen. So there's going to be a request, and this is a fascinating request. It says in verse 35, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, I have never been to somebody ever in my life that said, I want you to do whatever I ask. Never. I wouldn't do that with my parents. Because they would go, I don't think so. I mean, have you ever been up to somebody and said, I want you to do whatever I ask? That's just not going to happen. And so this is a very bold ask. Let me tell you a little bit about this. If you do a little research, you'll find out that James and John are actually first cousins of Jesus. Their mother is Jesus' aunt. Now, if you read over Matthew, you find out that their mother is also in on this request. So I think they're putting a little family weight on him. The aunt comes, the cousins come, and they're saying, hey, we want you to do whatever we ask. They're not just his disciples, they're blood kin. And so they're thinking they can put a little pressure on him. So it's interesting that what Jesus says to them when they ask. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? So he's going to bring this down to where it needs to be. He's like, this is... This is a ridiculous ask. What do you really want? Is what he's saying. What do you really want from me? There's something going on. What do you want? So he says, be more specific. And this is what they ask. They said to him, grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. So we think that do whatever we want is a big ask. Now they're saying, hey, we want to be on the right and left and come into power. When you come in your court, we want to be the top dogs. We want to be at the top with you on your right and your left. This is not a small ask. They're talking about being above not just all the other disciples, the other apostles. They're talking about being on the right and left. What about Moses? What about Elijah? What about all the great prophets that have come before? Jesus even said to them that John the Baptist was greater than all the prophets before him. And they want to be on the right and the left. So they're, they're asking a big thing when, it, uh, when they ask this. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you ask. And that's funny, isn't it? You don't know what you're asking. You ever had somebody tell you that? You ask them something, you don't know what you're asking. This is going to be trouble. This is going to be a problem. You don't know what you're asking. He says, are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Now, before I get to their answer, I want to talk a little about this whole idea of what they're asking. What they're asking is to be the, the two most important individuals in the Messianic kingdom that's coming. They want power, glory, authority, prestige, importance, and position. That is not what Jesus is going to talk to them about in this context. But that's what they want. Now, the Jews had this thing. They thought Jesus was going to be a physical Savior, a physical Messiah and King. They thought he was going to be David's descendant. He would sit on the throne, and he was going to come into Israel. He was going to make everything good. He was going to kick the Romans so far out that they would never be able to come back again. So they didn't understand his mission and purpose yet, even though he told them, I came to die, gentlemen. He had just told them, I came to die, and then I'm going to be resurrected. They don't get it. They do not understand. They only see his tremendous power and authority on earth, and they want to share that. They want to be on his right and his left. So he says, you don't know what you ask. They don't really get it at all. In fact, if they knew what was coming, they would have repented and, and, and said, okay, we don't want any part of this because of what is coming. He says, are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink? 
Now this is the cup of suffering. The cup of wrath. The cup of God's wrath that's going to be poured out on Jesus for all sin, for all time. There's going to be a lot of suffering with this cup of wrath. Jesus just told them what's going to happen. He says, I'm going to be tried by the Jews. I'm going to be turned over to the Gentiles. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be spit on. I'm going to be scourged. In other words, whip with the cat and iron whip. And then I'm going to be killed. He says, can you take that cup that's coming on me? And not only that, the cup he's talking about is going to be the cup of wrath that God pours on him. And Jesus himself is going to... To, to suffer immensely because he's going to have all the sin of the world put on him. So there's going to be a tremendous amount of suffering that goes with this. And he says, can you drink that cup? They have no idea what they're talking about. But then he says, can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? Baptism is an immersion, we know that. But it's an overwhelming of the body and water. The baptism he is talking about is the baptism that will overwhelm mind and body and soul with the pain, the rejection, the suffering, and the sacrifice Jesus was to make on the cross for the sins of all mankind. Was Jesus not overwhelmed in the garden? It says that he was so overwhelmed he was almost to the point of death when he went to pray. Sweat like drops of blood. I mean, he was very intense in the garden. And this is just a short time before this. So Jesus already feels the weight of what's coming. He knows the pain is going to come, and he knows he's going to be separated from the Father. When he tells God on the cross, why have you forsaken me? So he's feeling that way. He feels it then. He feels it in Gethsemane, and he feels it on the cross. And this is what they say to him after he gets done talking about, can you do this? They don't understand what's coming. He does. They said, we're able. We're able. Go for it, Jesus. We are able to take whatever you bring on us. I'm thinking, you know, because we can look from my side and go, man, they just have no idea what's coming to them. But I believe they're very sincere. I don't doubt this, this apostle's sincerity. They know what he's predicted. They heard him. They just heard him say that. I don't know if they think it's really going to happen. I don't know if they understand what it all means for them. But I know that they can feel the pressure he's under. I know they can feel his intensity. But they completely say, yes, we are able to do this. So he tells them what's going to happen. He says, guess what? You are going to drink that cup. He says, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the baptism I am baptized, you will be baptized. You are going to suffer. You are going to suffer these things. And they don't realize how much they'll be devastated. That night, Jesus is going to be arrested. Jesus is going to, well, it's not that night, but in the next week or so. They don't realize the pain and suffering is coming for them, not just for Jesus. When he's arrested and tried and crucified, they're going to be lost. They're going to have no idea of what to do. They're going to go in fear and hide because they're so afraid of what's going on. And even after he's resurrected and he comes in power and he gives them the gift of the Holy Spirit, when they go preach, what happens to them? Did anybody love them? Did anybody treat them kindly? Absolutely not. They would face severe persecution. They would be rejected by many of the Jews. They would face imprisonment, beatings, and much suffering. In Acts 12, 1 and 2, we know that James was killed. He was going to be beheaded by uh, one of the Herods. And John is going to be exiled to the island of Patmos, and a lot of people kind of get the idea, well, he lived in a cave on the Isle of Patmos, and he, you know, wrote his visions of, of what happened in Revelation. But it, it, the, the traditions say that he died in the mines of the Isle of Patmos. So there's going to be intense suffering for John as well. Now, they don't know this yet. They don't understand this yet, but Jesus does. He knows what they're going to face. He knows what he's going to face. But then he tells them this. He says, but the sin on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it's for those for whom it is prepared. He's telling them, guess what? I don't even have the power to give that. See, God the Father is going to decide he's going to be on the right and the left. And he already has somebody that that's prepared for. And you're not it. You're not going to sit in those positions of power. But guess what? You are going to suffer like I've suffered. 
He tells them that that's what's going to happen. And they won't get that until later. After he dies and is crucified and is resurrected, and they, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and they start to understand the things said, I think it, it probably comes home to them what's going to happen in the future. There's going to be suffering for them. There's going to be sacrifice. So they leaned on him with a little bit of family love, and they did not get what they wanted. They wanted power and authority and prestige. They didn't get any of that. But they will get the cup, and they will get the baptism that he had to deal with. So then something interesting happens. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. Now a lot of versions will say they became indignant. Now, think about this. Here's the 12. They hear James and John are over there talking to Jesus, saying, hey, we want to be number one and two. We want to be above all these guys. Now, who really was, was probably number one, at least among the apostles, we think Peter was. Peter was, was kind of the one that was always going forward, always seemed to, to, to be doing things. And so we kind of think of Peter in, in those lines. I don't know if that's the way it was, but they get mad. They don't like this. They get frustrated. They're irritated. Now, why were they irritated? Maybe because James and John beat them to the punch. Could be. It could be that they felt like James and John were using their family connection to push Jesus into something. It could be they were afraid that James and John would get the request that they asked, that they would be put over everybody. Could be that they just don't like the idea of James and John being put ahead of them. I don't know. But they're mad. They don't like this. But Jesus is not going to reprimand the ten. He's going to reprimand all twelve. He's going to tell them some things right here that are important. But Jesus called them to himself and he said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever you, of you desires to be first shall be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So now, after all that's been said, all that's been done so far, now Jesus is going to basically put them in their place. He's going to tell all 12 of them, you have the wrong attitude. You have the wrong mindset. You have missed totally what my purpose and my mission is. You have not been listening to what I want you to understand. So he's going to tell them what it means to be a leader. Right here. He says, guess what? If you want to be a leader, you're going to have to be a suffering servant. He says, all these things right after he's basically washed their feet. You look over John. This, this idea comes up after he washed their feet. And so he served them. He showed them what service was when he washed their feet, didn't he? He said, I am your master and your teacher have washed your feet. This is a job for a servant, for a slave. And yet none of you did it, but I did it. I did this for you. He said, if you want to be uh, what I want you to be, you have to do this for each other. You have to serve each other. And so now he's, he's reiterating that idea. And he says to them, tells them what a true servant looks like. He says, the Gentile, the Roman way, the way of the world, his leaders are chosen by other leaders. By favors and money, power, soldiers, wealth, whatever they trade around, to be chosen as a leader. These leaders use their authority to lord it over the people. They tax them, they abuse them, they, they use armed enforcement, they use cruelty, tyranny, and death if needed. One of our elders was talking about an incident in Acts where the disciples were preaching and money was, <clears throat> was being influenced. <clears throat> money was being taken away from people and there was a riot that was, was being started. And the guy that was the head of the, the area said, we need to stop this riot right now. And it wasn't because he thought so much of the disciples. It's because he knew if they had a riot, the Romans were going to come. And if the Romans came, when the Romans came, people died. I don't know if we understand that Roman power was complete in that area of the world. They controlled everything. And when they came to put down a, a rebellion, they didn't give the people on the wrist. They didn't even scourge people. They crucified them by the thousands. And they left them there to hang for people to know Roman power is free. 
That's what they did. And so Jesus is telling them, don't be like the Romans. Don't be after those things. Don't want those things. That's not what you should be doing. He said, don't be like Gentile leaders. Don't be intimidating. Don't put fear in people. Don't make people do by what is right by your power and your might. There's two kinds of leadership. There's positional leadership. It is given by titles, by armies, by force. No choice of the people. That's the way the rulers rule. Power, might, and authority, and they had unwilling followers. Then there's relational leadership. You rule by relationship. You have willing followers. You rule by love and kindness, compassion, care, and service. And Jesus is telling him, that's the way you lead. You are not to be like them. You're to be like me. He said, I'm a servant leader. I have served you. You need to serve others. So he says, there's no lords, there's no masters, there's only servants. He says, you need to render service to others. He says, you need to be the slave of all. In fact, you need to be engrossed in meeting others' needs. He's saying, greatness is defined by suffering for others, sacrificing for others, and serving others. He says, to, great, to be great, you've got to be a servant. To be first, you have to be last of all. You have to put others before yourself in every situation and every opportunity. Of course, Jesus had just shown them exactly what that meant by washing their feet. He showed them humility, care, compassion, kindness, over and over. Not just by washing their feet, by, but by his whole life and his whole ministry. And he was shown on the cross as well, in the greatest example of all. So the Son of Man, who actually is the one that was sit on the throne, would not physically sit on the throne at that time. He was the Christ. He was the Son of God. He was the Chosen One. But He didn't come to rule. He came to serve. In fact, it says, He says, I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for me. So Jesus will give up everything to serve them and us. So they don't totally get His example right then, but they're starting to get the idea of what He's talking about. And after he dies, is resurrected, and the Holy Spirit comes, they start to understand what it means to be a servant. Because they start to do the same things he did. The next 4, 12, and following, it says that, that, that they tell the people that, you know, this is the only way. That basically is what they tell them. But something right after that is very interesting. It says that they took notice of the disciples. Said so they could tell they'd been with Jesus. Folks, we need to be a people that, that people know who we are because we've been with Jesus. And we know we've not physically been with him. But we understand what he was like. We understand what he was about. And we understand the kind of life that he lived and the kind of life that we should live as well. See, Jesus was the ultimate servant. He gave his life as a ransom for, for me and for you and for everyone who would come to faith in all the ages. He paid the ultimate Christ to free all the captives from sin and from death. Their bondage has ended, and we need to understand our bondage has ended because of Jesus. Jesus' death and resurrection has set us all free. One of the songs I love, and there's many, that there is power, power, wonder, working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder, working power in the precious blood the land. And that deserves an amen. So our challenge is this. If we're to be suffering servants, we have to understand that it takes sacrifice and service to others. And Yon Salam, brother and sister team, they serve their brothers and sisters in Africa. And they did very well. They understand. We need to be like Jesus. The way he served his disciples and the way he serves us. It comes down to this stuff. This is my last thought for the evening. It comes down to basic theology. Pilate had a chance to free Jesus. His wife had told him, you need to let this man go. He himself wanted to let Jesus go. But you know what he chose to do? He chose to wash his hands of the whole thing. 
So he went to the basin of water and he washed his hands and he said, This man's blood is on you, not on me. He chose the easy way out. Jesus had a basin as well. He had a basin of service. And he used it to serve his disciples, to, to help them understand what he was about and who he was. And he used it to give them an example, leading up to the greatest example of all, when he would die for them. Because he was about sacrifice and service. So here's the question we need to end with. What will we choose? Will we choose the basin of selfishness? That's what Pilate chose. I want the easiest thing. I don't want anything to do with this. I'm going to wash my hands of any trouble or difficulty. Or we can choose the basin of Jesus. The basin of Jesus is about three things. About suffering, about service, and about sacrifice. So what would we choose? That's the most important thing of all. If there's a need tonight for anybody, you need to be baptized into Christ or need to, to get yourself right with the Lord, or even if you need prayers for this church, the praise you we uh, stand and sing. Yeah. In the soul, why will you linger wandering?